It's time for another installment of Flashpoint. This week, investigator Mike Holfeld sits down with Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer on the recent tragedy that hit Central Florida. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike Holfeld. Our guest today on Flashpoint, a tremendous leader, Mayor Buddy Dyer. Thanks for joining us, sir. Let me, before I get started on this, let me just tell you, your leadership has not gone unnoticed, and this is nothing you rehearse for. Has it been tough on you and your team? It has, but you respond in crisis. That's what you have to do. And, um, you know, I've just been so supported by so many different people. And anybody that had any role, either in the um, incident itself, in making sure that we saved lives, to the response um, afterwards, just have exceeded any expectation. Everybody's done their job. And you think about so many city and county uh, employees that filled roles that certainly were not their normal lane. Um, none of us have done this victim's assistance uh, stuff before, so just I was going to say, yeah, up. you don't rehearse for this. Biggest surprise or toughest stumbling block for you? I would say the toughest moment I had was the second press conference on the 12th when I had to come out and tell everybody that it was not 20, it was 50. Turns out it was 49, but that it was a much larger situation than we had envisioned. I remember it well. Every reporter there, there was a gasp. There was a gasp. One Orlando, let's fast forward to that. I mean, the giving has just been overwhelming. And I've gotten a lot of emails over the last few weeks. Mike uh, asked the mayor, will the money be dispersed in a timely fashion? And then as more money comes in, how do you decide who gets it? We don't want people with a handout that obviously don't deserve it. So we immediately not Sunday, but probably Monday, had some of our corporate citizens say we want to participate. Uh, I think the first pledge might have been Disney at a million bucks, million dollars. So we started down the road of, okay, how do we distribute this? We don't have any model. Right. And we initially thought we would just uh, set up a fund at the Central Florida Community Foundation and have them distribute the funds but their guidelines are such that they can only give money to um, registered not-for-profits. I see. And we wanted to go down the route of giving the money directly to the victims and their families. So we got in contact with the gentleman that administered the Boston Fund and the New York Fund, and then we set up a, uh, an organizing group headed up by Alex Martins to figure out the appropriate methodology to distribute dir directly to the victims and it's going to be measured I would say in weeks rather than months some of the other groups it, it took a long time for them to get it done yes, sir. we had the good fortune that we already had a not-for-profit set up in the city of Orlando called strength in Orlando mm -hmm. so we were able to direct the funds and segregate them in strength in Orlando under the umbrella of one Orlando and then we need we set up a board that's uh, Five members are from the foundations that gave either half a million or a million, two from the Latino community, two from the LGBT community, and two from the philanthropic community. And then we're sorting through with the guidance of uh, the gentleman that did the Boston Fund, how, what's the methodology? Who gets what right. and how much? So, so we, you're working through all of that. We're working through that. And then the other thing yeah. is why, uh, we met the immediate needs through the Victims Assistance Center. We had 35 agencies that do that, you know, that we provided burial services, we provided funerals, we pr provided travel arrangements, so airline. I know, it's been uh, incredible. Hotels, everything that they could need. I think we met every need that any victim or family member had except those that were longer term needs and we said well you don't need that in the next three days that's something you need in the next couple of weeks right I wanted to get your take on this my sense is the community is coming together in an extraordinary way there's an acceptance now uh, we've come together as a family an extended family would you agree I am so proud of our community uh, you know we've done things together whether it's venues or Sunrail but we are Orlando United. I think people's hearts are bigger today. They're more accepting of everybody, irrespective of what they, their lifestyles may be. Um, and I think that one pastor said Orlando has been anointed to 
be a messenger to the world on diversity, inequality, and inclusion, and I think we've stepped up to that message. I think you're right. Listen, I want to talk about a permanent memorial. Let's take a break here, folks. We'll be right back. Buddy Dyer with me. Back in a couple of minutes. Whether in Are you open to doing that? We are. As you know, we've released a transcript of one of the 911 calls and summaries of some of the other calls. Uh, when we have a situation like this, as we did in San Bernardino, where the killer is deceased, we are able to provide more information than we are often able to do when the matter is being handled in court as part of a court investigation where, again, we are limited by the rules of evidence and what will be in court. Um, so we are looking to be as transparent as possible and to provide as much information as possible over the course of time. We certainly are open to that. I can't tell you when or in what context, but I can tell you that we are open to that. Well, uh, that's Welcome back. Uh, the Attorney General weighing in on that with me a few weeks ago during a news conference. Your take on that. Should those recordings be released? You know, uh, it, it's a delicate balance, and the FBI's concern is to not compromise their investigation. So they're investigating other individuals that may have had knowledge of the shooter's intentions. So I understand their perspective. My perspective is different than that, but I have to recognize their perspective. I'd rather release everything that we possibly can because I would like everybody to know just how heroic the police officers and other first responders were that night and to understand what the situation was there. So there's 911 recordings of the, the killer, but there's also a lot of 911 information where people were either had called directly from inside right. the nightclub or were texting to say their parent and the parent was on 911. So uh, this has been released, I, I think, so I can talk about this Go a ahead. little bit. There, the, uh, the killer also spoke with um, our crisis negotiators on a couple of occasions and at some point he indicated that he had b explosive vest and that he was going to put it on four of the remaining hostages and then position them in the corners of the building for maximum effect or to keep us from re-entering the building or yeah. the, the other. Yeah. But we were getting independent confirmation of that from people who were hostage in, in the restroom. There. So it didn't turn out to be true, but if you had it from the shooter and you had it from one of the hostages, you absolutely have to believe that is the case, that that's occurring. And, and I guess what must have happened was the the hostage must have heard him talking to the negotiator and couldn't see and just assume that that was true. But there's there's information like that that I'd really like the public to be able to get the full full view of things because one of the things that was lost because there wasn't enough information out there was people were led to believe that there was the initial gun fight and then right. nothing else occurred between then and five o'clock exactly. and that's wholly untrue. The First officer engaged him at the door, drove him back, and shortly thereafter, there were other officers, and, and actually one of them was from Eatonville, one was from Belle Isle, and a couple of our SWAT guys drove him back in, well, he ran, is right, what happened, right, right, into right. the bathroom, and ha he took hostages into the bathroom. And there's a uh, bathroom, there was a hallway, bathroom where he was, door, and another bathroom where there were a bunch of individuals as well. So these 911 calls will show once and for all OPD handled this thing the right way. Well, what's misunderstood is during the, the course of that time, two things occurred. We engaged him on the phone and there was no further shooting between then and when we breached the wall. And we were evacuating the victims that were still living from the other areas of the nightclub. So we were evacuating people, or OPD yes. was evacuating, right. and then getting them to the hospital. So all the while during the course of those two hours, people were being saved and taken out of the nightclub. Either they were running out or we were car carrying them out. Let's talk about first responders and that 4th of July fireworks. Let's take a breath here for a minute. We're, we're being so intense, but this is going to be a happy time. I think for the community. Uh, what special things will be happening during that 4th of July? Well, primarily that we are going to honor the first responders that participated on June the 12th. Um, they are heroic. Everybody from the FBI to the FDLE, uh, the various sheriff 
agencies around Central Florida, especially the OPD and the SWAT team that ended it by breaching the wall and taking down the shooter. So we'll be honoring them. I can't imagine how many people we're going to have for Fourth of July. Me we neither. routinely have over 100,000, and we had 50,000 for uh, one of the vigils we had that uh, a week yes. after the 12th, so I guess that would have been the 19th, Sunday the 19th, so um, I think everybody will want to come show their patriotism, but also they'll want to do some more healing and be together and be supportive. The memorial, we have a lot of souls lost that didn't deserve to die, none of them did. What about a permanent memorial, your thoughts on that? We will definitely have a permanent memorial, but one of the things that we have uh, used as a guiding principle through the course of everything is that if you don't have to make a decision right now, don't make that decision. Focus on the things that are directly ahead of you or that are, need to be accomplished in the next several days. So um, we immediately designated uh, the Performing Arts Center as a site for a temporary memorial because people could gather there yeah. and uh, pay their respects. But there have been temporary memorials that have sprouted all over the place, it. like Beauty, the 49 crosses that are there inside the City Hall Rotunda, the 49 wreaths. Um, right. I think in front of each of the sea art pieces around Lake Eola. I know there's there was a nice memorial in front of the, mu the reclining mm -hmm. muse. So a couple of thoughts on a permanent memorial. Um, I'm not sure how many of the victims chose are offered to, to have a free plot at Greenwood Cemetery, mm -hmm. but it might be appropriate to do something there, and it's along the outer perimeter of the cemetery, so if people wanted to lay stuff at a memorial, they could do so without going all the way into the cemetery. They sure. could do it on the outside, so that's a potential location. Of course, the Pult site itself is the most obvious location, and I've spoken with the owner on several occasions. Um, they initially talked about rebuilding, but I think we're done with that. That's the most likely thing. And we're gonna go about it in a first class way. We'll probably do a call to artists and figure out what an appropriate memorial piece would be. Gosh, that's fantastic. You brought up the pulse. What would you do? Would you level it, refurbish, refurbish it? I know they're wrestling with that. They've been wrestling with it over the last few weeks. Um, Again, it's a decision we don't need to make today, but my initial thought would be not to rebuild a nightclub there, but to use it as a site for the memorial and maybe incorporate the Pulse sign in some way. How are you holding up? You know, I immediately listened to the debriefing that OPD and OFD did with the uh, counselors and they said get back in your regular routine make sure you get a lot of water if you exercise exercise I do exercise in the morning so I immediately got into my normal mode I think by Wednesday I started Did you? working out again so um, but it's been a lot of adrenaline and I am dogged tired <laughs> at the end of virtually every day I'm sure you are because um, you know it's not the physical part it's the emotional part yeah and believe me, we're proud of you. Uh, I have to ask you this, we're on high alert, I know. Will that continue for weeks, for months? Are we always gonna be on high alert? You know, um, I've thought a lot about why the killer might have chosen to come to Orlando versus go to Miami or Fort Pierce. Yeah. Um, and there's no way to really know, but I suspect he did because our name is known worldwide, and if you say shooting in Orlando, um, it means that something a little more to people because we're the happiest place on earth. And I, I'm not disparaging Fort Pierce in any way, but people don't know where Fort Pierce is. And right. most people say in England would not have heard of Fort Pierce, but they know Orlando and it's a place that's supposed to be happy and you come and visit to have great memories with your family. What do you want to, what's your final message to all of us this morning? My final message would be how proud I am of this community. Um, I said on day one that we would not be defined by the um, hateful act of a deranged killer. We'd be defined by how we respond. We have responded with love and compassion and unity and I couldn't be more proud to be the mayor of this great city. We're proud to have you as the mayor. Buddy Dyer, thanks so much. That's this edition of Flashpoint. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.